My name is Alok Sinder. I'm a partner at Fifth Wall focusing on our climate infrastructure strategy. That strategy focuses on investing in capital intensive businesses, oftentimes funded by venture capital. And obviously today you're going to meet and have met a number of our individuals in the climate tech venture practice. These businesses are capital intensive and the goal is to fund their first of a kind factories, power plants, uh, enabling them to grow and hopefully to maturation. And uh, today we're joined by a number of CEOs and co-founders in a sector that I think is critically important, uh, the circular economy. I wanna take a moment and talk about that uh, and, and, and a brief introduction before I hand it over to our, our four panelists today. Uh, first, what I want you to do is imagine a world where waste is a thing of the past, where items that are pr produced and created one time don't, don't last that one time, but are actually lasting multiple life cycles. And that is the promise of the circular economy, an opportunity for us, not just environmental, but economic, to drive progress. And uh, in a world where scarcity is well known, and we've seen it through inflation and resource struggles, frankly, most wars are fought over these kinds of resource scarcity. Uh, the circular economy can be a critical solution uh, going forward. So without further ado, I'd like to take a moment here and introduce our, our panelists. Uh, first, we have Suvi Sharma, co-founder and CEO, CEO of SolarCycle, also the first investment in our climate infrastructure strategy. Uh, then we have Graham Ryan, CEO and founder of Roadrunner. Uh, we have Cody Friesen, CEO and co-founder of Source Water. Uh, and we have our Source Water bottles in the back here for any of you including here on the stage. And then lastly, but not least, we have Ahmad Garaman, uh, who is CEO and co-founder of Cyclic Materials. Uh, what I'd like to do first is uh, give everyone a moment here, and starting with Suvi, to have them have a chance to introduce themselves and their companies. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Suvi Sharma, uh, CEO at SolarCycle. Uh, I've been in the solar industry for about 18 years now, kind of hard to believe. Um, this is my third solar startup. Founded two companies previously, Solaria and Next Tracker, that are publicly traded now. And I took a step back from the operating role and saw that we hadn't yet addressed the end of life of solar. We had done a phenomenal job in, in, in taking solar from a cottage industry. When, when I got into it, solar was about 0.3% of new generating capacity that went in. And last year in the US, it was over 50%. So solar is the new king of energy. And, uh, now there's a new set of problems and challenges to deal with, which is how we take these end-of-life panels and do something good with it. We want to turn a waste into an opportunity. And so in a nutshell, what we are doing at SolarCycle is to take an old solar panel, recycle it, get all the materials out, and, make, and get materials and make materials for the next generation of solar panels and create. And my, and my goal is to create the most circular industry in the world uh, in the solar industry. So pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Graham Ryan founder and CEO of Roadrunner. Uh, definitely honored to be up here among other climate CEOs driving forward the future. But yeah, so Roadrunner is a company I started nine years ago. We are a tech-centric waste and recycling services company. Uh, and we help businesses really, to what Alok said, imagine a future where waste is a problem of the past. That's pretty close to our mission statement. So. Um, uh, we, we specifically help businesses manage their waste, help them save money, and, and advance their landfill diversion goals. Started small, but uh, nine years later, we're now nationwide, and most recently this past summer, we surpassed over one million tons of uh, recyclables out of landfill. So that's been great. But yeah, honored to be here. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. My name's Cody Friesen. I'm the founder and CEO of Source, a renewable water technology company. And I've been in the renewable space for a little over 20 years, I guess, now. And uh, I think everybody here is familiar with uh, solar modules, obviously take in sunlight and make electricity. Uh, what we do is we make something we call a source hydro panel, which looks like a thick module, looks like a thick solar module, but instead of taking in sunlight and making electricity, it takes in sunlight and air and makes perfect drinking water. Now in 52 countries around the world in applications from uh, hotels to developments to individual homes, the whole communities. And 
Um, I think everybody's familiar with sort of a, you know, a solar module array on the south facing pitch of a, of a roof in a master plan community. And of course that reduces the electricity cost for uh, the homeowner. But once that array is up on the roof, they never interact with that renewable energy again. When you have source hydro panels on your roof, when you get up in the morning, you drink yesterday's sunlight. And it's something kind of magical to hold this thing that's massive in your hand and be able to consume it and know that it's perfect water independent of all infrastructure. And so in the same way that solar for electricity has democratized electricity around the world, you know, we're democratizing a resource that you either get from a government and it may or may not be good, or you have to go to the store and buy it. And we change that, we democratize it, we make it yours independent of that infrastructure. And these bottles, what's in that bottle is uh, what was in the air in the Arizona desert and now is in a sustainable package produced renewably and is really sort of whatever the uh, opposite of a loss leader is. <laughs> it's an it's a awareness, awareness campaign, right? Every one of these bottles is telling a story about this paradigm that we're, we're creating as a company. So really excited to be here and have this conversation. Okay, uh, Ahmad Garaman here, CEO and uh, co-founder of Cyclic Materials. Cyclic Materials is a recycling company that focuses on a subset of critical metals that are called rare earth metals. Those are the metals that we focus on. For those of us not really uh, strong on the chemistry side, those metals sit at the bottom of periodic table. And those metals, when you integrate those with iron and a few other metals, they help you to make the most uh, 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 strongest magnets that we can manufacture out there and those help us to make the most efficient electric motors that we can put those in electric vehicles in, in wind turbines and many other applications and and let's think of it this way the batteries lithium-ion batteries that we put in many different applications are expensive so we put a lot of dollars into those to store energy in there so it just makes sense to use the most efficient uh, uh, electric motors uh, to use that electricity. That's why the consumption of those rare earth magnets are skyrocketing in the market. Our business around, uh, is around recycling of those motors, which rare earth elements would be the core of the business. And alongside that, some, some other uh, critical metals, including copper, aluminum, maybe we, we sell some of those to you in the future for your bottles, and other metals we recycle with extremely low carbon footprint, and, and, and that would be our business to help with circularity of the critical metals. Uh, in the past life, I have been providing technology to multiple other companies. Some of those are out in the market, uh, such as Lifecycle, lithium-ion battery recycling, and some others are, are, are uh, building their commercial plants, such as JDO Resources and Cyclic Materials, is with the same thesis, helping with the circularity of, of the metals for our electrified society. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's have some fun here. I have a few questions, but I also just wanna give a chance for our panelists to uh, speak freely. So I'll start off with my first question, um, and it kind of goes back to a little bit of my introduction of, well, why does the circular economy matter? And I'd like each of the panelists to spend a moment about their companies, and I'm gonna tee it off with Cody, actually, because I remember a quote from Paul Krugman that said, future wars will be fought over water. And so maybe, Cody, would love your thoughts on this uh, topic. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, never forget that Mark Twain is quoted as saying that uh, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. So it's not just future wars, but pretty much all wars and uh, issues related to water. Um, I mean, I think probably most people realize that probably the most linear of resources that we use as a society is, is water, fresh water, right? I mean, it rains out of the sky or snows out of the sky, uh, flows downhill into a reservoir, flows into a, a water treatment plant, flows to your home, and then eventually out to water treatment plant and then to the ocean. It doesn't get more linear than that. And so breaking that cycle, fundamentally changing the wait for it to, a rent, to rain, moving from a all of history resourcing of water to one that is programmable, renewable, uh, um, distributed, infrastructure free, and really kicking off um, different resourcing, sustainable resourcing in a way that um, you know, enables, you know, master plan community developers to, you know, instead of having to wait for or figure out water rights, you know, in, you know, in Arizona and, you know, on some massive tract of land, be able to program those, that water resource in real time. So it fundamentally shifts the game um, when you can sort of break away from that pure linear 
uh, a purely linear nature of, of water. And keep in mind that um, there's something like 10 to the 16 kilograms of water in the troposphere, so that's one and then 16 zeros a kilogra kilograms, that's about a million years of all of humanity's water at any given time in the atmosphere. The average water molecule lasts one week before it falls back to the earth. And when you think about sort of the renewable nature of that resource, tapping into that along with the renewable nature of obviously sunlight um, opens up a new channel for, for something so critical to our, our society. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it to Suvi now to talk a little bit about solar panels and silver. Because I think a lot of people don't know that potentially 15 to 20% of all the silver in the world now goes to solar panels. So maybe Suvi, you can talk a little bit about that and that importance among other important materials in solar panels. Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, we, we have one planet, we have finite resources, we have finite space. So um, personally, I don't really want to go to Mars, I'd rather stay on Earth. So we have to figure out how to create a circular loop here to be more sustainable on the way we live. I started taking a deep dive into solar panels because something I knew well and something that I saw was, uh, was, was something that we had not yet figured out how to create a circular supply chain for. And like you pointed out, Lok, um, you know, solar panels use somewhere between 15 and 20% of the world's annual silver supply and growing quite rapidly. The, the latest studies I've seen show that within a decade, they would theoretically use 100% of the world's silver supply just with the growth of solar. And so um, I've actually gone and seen a silver mine. It's a really dirty process um, and it's very hard to even build any more silver mines or uh, create more silver mines. So we have to get the silver out of the panels. Um, I mean, that's, that's really the fundamental thing, but it's, uh, and, and, and it's gonna be done. I mean, the, the beauty of it is it's an engineering problem. Um, so it's very solvable and, and, and we are able to get the silver and the copper out today from our first facility that's running in Texas for recycling these panels. But we had to develop new equipment, new processes, new technologies that had never been done before. The reason why solar panels are so cheap and efficient is over decades, the industry developed the right equipment, tools, processes, scaled it up. So we got to do the same thing now for creating the recycling infrastructure for it, which is what we're in the midst of doing. There's another interesting thing in, in solar panels there. They, they use a lot of aluminum. Most of the frames are aluminum. Uh, the World Bank did a study that uh, showed that in the energy transition, the clean energy transition, the single biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions, and that is, is aluminum frames for solar panels. When you take aluminum frames out of a solar panel and you recycle it, it uses 95% less energy and carbon than uh, uh, making it with bauxite. So getting this aluminum out, putting it back into the manufacturing chain, these are the kinds of, I can go on and on and pour you to tears, but these are the kinds of things that we have to get out of these, out of these old products figure out how to, it's not just also figuring out how to extract them, it's also figuring out how to make new materials out of them. That's, that's another area of opportunity for the industry is to recycle and remanufacture and really create value streams out of these. And that's what I think also creates more sustainable businesses for companies like SolarCycle. Okay, so um, I, I, I'm gonna, uh, go to a different topic for the moment. We can always come back to some of the other ideas on the importance of circular economy. And here I'd like Graham to talk a little bit about recycling specifically and, and kind of in today's volatile economic times, you see rising inflation, you see struggles in the economy, potential recession on the horizon, various factors like that are headwinds. Do you view recycling and, and specifically the work you do at Roadrunner as a, you know, a, a luxury good or an essential item? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm a waste and recycling guy, so I like to keep things pretty simple. Um, I think where I get aspirational is no matter what, at the end of the day, a recycling option or certainly a circular option is the more profitable outcome. And so um, it's really about the pace of change or transformation to actually get there. And that's, that's what the industry is tackling right now. So I, you know, I fast forward and say, okay, what's holding us back from that? Um, to me, it's, it's, it's likely a lack of insight to that path to profitability or that path of implementation that holds most businesses back. That coupled with a, an industry like the waste industry in the US, which is incredibly dominated by waste companies. Um, I just think businesses, property owners, 
They just need a clearer view of what's totally possible and achievable without a whole lot of lift. Um, so that's, that's what we focus on at Roadrunner, trying to make uh, it palatable, trying to make uh, increasing your diversion or implementing a circular model uh, in a totally achievable but also profitable uh, initiative. Uh, any others? W where do you feel? Do you feel like in this current environment, folks have started to reduce their recycling or circular economy habits or, or cash flow and investment? Or do you feel like that th in the current economic situation, uh, you know, full, full speed ahead? I might be able to, to talk, talk, talk about that. So I think it's going full speed ahead. There might be a little bit pause at moments, but I think overall, in the next very short brief time, it will be coming back again with stronger than ever, basically, uh, process going forward. Uh, we need metals. We, we, we need metals desperately for electrification of our society and, and to go forward. Basically, our energy transition is going to be built upon metals. For instance, just some examples, to make uh, 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 more environmentally sustainable water, water bottles, we need aluminum. For solar panels, we need aluminum and silver. For electric vehicles, we need three and a half times copper and more other metals for our wind turbines and, 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 and so on. Uh, so with increase of metals mining, basically we are going to pollute the environment a bit more. This is a little bit counterintuitive unless and until you integrate circularity into the conversation. So it becomes really a necessity to have circularity as part of our future basically to recycle those metals and put it back into the economy. Basically, when you recycle metals, you produce far, far less carbon dioxide. You produce next to nothing solid waste and emissions. And those are really the significant parts of recycling methods. So I think recycling of metals or circularity overall is not a luxury. It's, it's, it's basically a necessity that we need for future and companies understand that. In fact, in past one year, we have had much more companies to come to us and ask about the metals that we recycle than the year before. So that's another indication that uh, the environment is really strong and they are asking for circularity basically. So our conclusion is recycling is a circular business, not a cyclical business, I guess. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't see any, uh, I mean, there's certainly differences in how much the metals can be worth, you know, based on what's going on. But I think fundamentally, I don't see companies looking at what's going on in the economy or stock market as decisions they're making in terms of recycling. And how, how do you, and this is a question for all of you, so please jump in whenever you'd like, but the focus is on government regulatory support or tailwinds or headwinds, right? Uh, obviously we had the Inflation Reduction Act among pieces of legislation in the US, a lot of credits for uh, generation, you saw it for green hydrogen, you saw it for manufacturing. Can you take advantage of some of those? Are, are there pieces of legislation or things that got left off the table that you think are critical that would help uh, you know, further the success of your companies or your sectors? So let me, uh, I think I'll hand it to Cody first, if that's okay, Cody, and see yeah, if you. Sure. I mean, Inflation Reduction Act, um, with respect to water, there's probably two dozen different lines associated with underserved communities, failing infrastructure, uh, indigenous uh, groups, there's still 1.5 million miles of lead pipes in the ground, so that there's, there's an element to, in there for, um, for removing lead. So Inflation Reduction Act, obviously, is a, is a big one. Um, the re-upping of the ITC and, and the evolving, uh, so that's um, uh, invex, investment tax credit for solar, um, that becoming uh, redefined in 2025 is actually critical uh, when we start thinking about uh, renewable energy uh, broadly, when we think, when you hear renewable energy, you think electricity, but really that's a special case. And the prediction is probably, you know, two decades in the future, we'll see the special case of electricity and then the panoply of uh, startups now that are thinking about renewable resources, whether that be water like us or uh, fertilizer and other resources that come, are sort of enable, uh, enable to be much more sustainable and potentially circular uh, with a sort of renewable mindset and renewable approach. Um, IRA is a good start, but it's certainly just the tip of the iceberg from what we need for investment from, and from a policy perspective to really get to the ultimate uh, uh, holy, you know, the holy grail of 
being able to hold to one and a half or two two, two Celsius of uh, of temperature rise. <clears throat> yeah, one one thing that I want to mention to this question is we saw at Roadrunner more momentum into landfill diversion programs or circular programs by large enterprises from the SEC's climate disclosures, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three um, emissions a few years back, then like in two years than we saw in 10 years. So even like before that, I think the national recycling rate, in my opinion, was actually decreasing. And we've just seen this uh, this uh, like giant momentum shift. So I think it's tied to the theme of obviously that is there is a correlation between the enterprise value of large businesses being more valuable if they're friendly companies. Um, so that that really direct line to profit I think is the key thing that you know all of us need to focus on to to move things forward faster. Yeah, I would say that um, you know carrot versus the stick. Uh, is really the, the the best way to go. So th there's an incentive uh, for companies. We're seeing that most acutely in batteries, right? The amount of investment going in the batteries because the government's supporting, incentivizing a circular supply chain. Um, they can do that in many areas. And one of the conversations we've had with them is to do the same thing in solar, what they've done for batteries, because there's a huge opportunity. And it's not just in solar, it's in everything from other resources. But those kind of incentive mechanisms can create a massive wave of investment that goes in, uh, just like in batteries and many other parts of the value chain. Maybe you can add a little bit on that as well, more specific to cyclic materials. Uh, IRA has been around for a year, so two sections of IRA overall uh, directly relates to rare earth metals that we recycle. That would be 45C and 48X, or maybe the other way around. Uh, 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 and, and, and of course, uh, uh, rare earth elements, uh, 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 are used to be, uh, well, we use them to manufacture magnets, and 93, 95% of those magnets come from one country. That adds a little bit geopolitics in there as well. So with that in mind, basically there is a proposal in the house right now that if the magnet material is produced in United States or Canada, then there is $20 per kilogram incentive for that magnet, and if that magnet is 90% from the material source in US and Canada, then that is $30 per kilogram. To put it in per, into respect, uh, perspective, it's basically 30% of the overall magnet cost. So that's pretty substantial. It's still a proposal in the US. In Europe, they are a little bit a bit uh, uh, ahead, ahead than, than us. Uh, basically in, in OEM sites, uh, original equipment manufacturer side, uh, uh, if you're using critical metals, you're basically obligated to use a portion of that metals that are recycled. And, and, and it's interesting about rare earth elements because there's only 1% recycled rare earth elements in the, in, in the world. We don't recycle them. That's, that's what we would like to change and we are changing it. But that also opens up another, another uh, space for us on, on incentive side and, and government support side as well. So um, what is, the role of government or regulatory that they're getting wrong at this point? Like, what are they missing? Is, is there something that you're saying, hey, I think, Ahmad, you did talk about some pending legislation, but anything else that you look at and you say, this is a roadblock, this is a problem? Or is it really more up to the commercial sector and, and individuals and companies to, to, to pull forward with an economic solution? I'll throw one in there, uh, which is just the Safe, Safe Water Act. Um, of 1978 or whatever it is, um, doesn't contemplate new sources of water as it probably shouldn't have. But obviously the ability for that legislation to be updated to accommodate new sources of water, it doesn't end up being much of a headwind for us in a lot of the communities that we go into today. Um, but <clears throat> you can see as this, as hydro panels continue to move down the, the cost curve and we start getting to volumes of water where whole communities, you know, if you have a master plan community in Arizona or, or the idea of a master plan community, you have to demonstrate you have a hundred year supply now in order to uh, build that. Um, even, even if you had what you thought were sufficient water rights when that land was bought. Um, and so as you think about now moving to uh, putting in basically the equivalent of a community solar array of hydro panels to supply all the water to that community and unlock that tract of land. Um, at that point, we trigger into 
uh, PWS, public water system. Uh, and at that point, then it, the bar goes far, you know, up quite a bit from the point of view of uh, how it's regulated. So there are things like that where, you know, obviously the U.S. government is just not good at being nimble. I know I'm shocking everybody, <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's one where um, it comes to mind. We're like, oh, yeah, if we could solve that, that actually would be an unlock in a lot of places. Yeah, <clears throat> obviously this is incredibly challenging, but um, where, where we see it a little bit is... Uh, we find some of the regulations, some of the policies are built by those who hold the power now in, in some of these industries. So um, EPR, Center Producer Reliability, um, is, is a controversial topic. Like in theory and spirit, it's excellent and we should make those producing things more accountable. But um, as it's most recently framed, it would, it would completely dominate the uh, waste and recycling industry through the largest consumer product company. So, you know, you, you, you want, um, I just get a little fearful of the direction that some of the policy goes because, you know, it might be away from the actual goal. Uh, let me move away from government and regulatory and focus a little bit on uh, the private sector and, and commercialization, as well as for our audience here, a number are investors in uh, the real estate industry, um, uh, portfolio companies that are also part of climate and, and sustainability broadly, how would you kind of think about the role of, you know, corporations and individuals, and maybe we can answer them separately perhaps, but how do you view that role and, and what do you think is necessary to kind of accelerate penetration, uptake, do you see people caring enough? Is it a matter of it's not cheap enough? Is it a matter of it's too inconvenient? How do you kind of make it, you know, kind of the default option to recycle in whatever industry or sector you're in? That's a tough one. You know, it's a really tough one because most people want to recycle, um, but and then people do oftentimes recycle and they're finding more and more that that's actually not getting recycled, right? And so there's, there's a cynicism sometimes that, that gets set in, but most people want to recycle. The question is, how do they do it? And they're not gonna go super out of their way to do it. Um, so, you know, looking at a microcosm, like for example, um, uh, back to our world of solar panels, you know, they're, they're on millions of homes now. The question is, how do you get them off those homes and into a recycling facility? And it takes a village, frankly. Um, you know, we can't, we can't go to a consumer and, or all the consumers that have solar panels on their homes. So we have to create a, a, a really a whole infrastructure, which is primarily business to business. But ultimately the question always is who's gonna pay for it? Because there's a cost um, of reverse logistics and bringing it in and initially. So I think the key is in a lot of these businesses, uh, and again, in batteries, you're seeing it more just because of the metals that are in there is to try and make it really cheap. To recycle and make it really cost effective so that it's almost free or, or we call it landfill parity you know if you can achieve landfill parity things really start to move and people can make that decision a lot easier to recycle and so uh, that for us is a big focus is just how to get to that level so it becomes easy for any consumer whether it's a big company or an individual <clears throat> yeah th this may be a little bit too tactical but um i think it's a great opportunity for corporations to lead, um, you know, I think the, what happens is when a corporation goes and there's some uncertainty to how it's implemented or evaluated, they would, you know, stick to current processes or past practice processes. Some of this stuff requires coming off that uh, with a different outcome of objectives. So I think, you know, there's, there's social pressure, there's consumer pressure, there's, you know, government pressure. Now's the time to create an evaluation methodology for projects and, and programs that might not be the same as you've always done it, but ultimately are probably the shortest path to getting success. Yeah, I mean, when, when we go into a community or into a, a company that, that uh, has drinking water stress of one form or another, um, we're, we're a switch and, sway, switch and save solution. So we're really moving at the speed of trust. You know, that's really the constraint, if you will, sort of the, the education element and the moving at speed of trust. So an example of the Navajo Nation, about 175,000 Navajo total, about 54,000, so call it a third of them, have no water, zero at home. Um, and so probably four years ago, we started with an installation of 
I think 17 homes, and then got a contract for I think another 50 homes, and then 540 homes, um, and then we're in the middle of uh, procurement on another 700 homes. And so, you know, that's not a community that, that is a community that guys like me have shown up for a long time and promised a lot of things and, and not delivered. And so making sure with these communities that, um, that, that ultimately from a, uh, you know, a business perspective will be great customers, uh, engaging them in a way that enables them to gain the benefit of what we do at Source uh, and in a way that's fully productive. When we talk about on the, on the company side, um, you know, we engage with a lot of mining companies. So, you know, you might have a mine that's uh, in a far-flung place in Chile or in Australia, and there might be 10,000 employees there, and the water has to be trucked to them on a daily basis. Um, again, how do we uh, engage in a way that drives education that accelerates their adoption uh, in, in a productive way? So we don't have constraints from a, you know, from a uh, sort of cost perspective or from a um, sort of decision maker perspective, but really from the point of view of what it takes to educate somebody about a paradigm shift that's so fundamentally different than how they're used to thinking about water. And so, you know, it's sort of the, an interesting dynamic that we've had to unlock. In cyclic materials case, again, I will single out uh, car manufacturers simply because the consumption of magnet by end of 2030 on the back of car manufacturers' need for magnets will triple to increase by, by three to five times. So that's substantial, and they are going to be the big, big, uh, the reason for big jump in magnet consumption in the industry in the next seven to 10 years. Uh, with that in mind, basically, uh, 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 auto manufacturers in past few years, they, they, they once worried about chips a few years ago, so they did a lot of work on that side. Next thing was battery materials. They were really struggling with battery materials. In fact, a lot of them expected to drop their uh, production in 2025-6 because battery materials will not be available. But then they, they did a lot of work on that side. Now these days they have started hiring new generation of people in their corporates, which we never had seen them in, in, in there before. And those are rare earth buyers. So this shows the, uh, and, and that's because rare earth metals are becoming a bottleneck in those companies. So this shows how interested they are in figuring out the supply chain and understanding how they can play their role in, in, in circularity of it. And also, of course, ESG side and environmentally sustainable source material also plays a role in that, in that sense that they would like to understand how they can source rare earth metals because to be fair, rare earth metals uh, are among the uh, most unclean metals when they come from mining industry, not recycled materials. So that's, that's another, another side of uh, rare earth recycling, basically. Thank you. Uh, we're just a we just have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to go through kind of a rapid fire couple of questions here, guys. So first one is, what do you what do you not recycle that you should? Right? One word answer is fine. Any answers here? Plastics when they are mixed. A little bit. I'm failing at getting the composting into the composting bin. Ah. Uh -huh. Um. Probably certain types of styrofoam. I almost said no comment, though, because I have a conflict, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't know, because I actually don't know sometimes what I can and what I can't recycle, ah, there you, go. you know, and that's, that's always a challenge. Okay. And last uh, couple of questions here, a little more fun. Uh, favorite Vegas casino game? I've never gambled in a casino. Oh, you asked to ask my wife about that. I, I, I yeah. In grad school, I ran a, a poker table, but I uh, will not uh, play games uh, when, that are mathematically against me, so I don't gamble. We have, we have, we have some people good at math here, right? Uh, gambling is a tax on people bad at math, so yeah, yeah. yep, yep. Well, listen, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, a round of applause for our panelists. Yeah. Thank you.